Coming up on Market to Market, farmers may be ahead of the curve on feeding a global population. And carnivores process cancer news about some of their favorites. Those stories and market analysis with Sue Martin next. 7.7% ahead of last year. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sukup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sukup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, March 3 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. Optimism across the nation has been on the rise since the election. However, some economists believe the increase was inevitable. According to the conference board, consumer confidence hit a 15-year high last month on the expectation for more jobs and business growth. The January unemployment rate, the last one under the Obama administration, rose to 4.8 percent, despite strong job growth and the lowest number of jobless claims since 1973. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average continues to ride a wave of its own as it spent the week in record territory. Since the 1960s, the question of whether or not we can feed an ever-growing population on a finite number of acres has loomed over the world's farmers. There has been a great deal of debate on how much production needs to increase, and new data has arrived with a surprising answer. Peter Tubbs takes a closer look. A study released this week suggests that estimates of global agricultural production needed to feed the world population in 2050 may have been too pessimistic. The Penn State University report theorizes that estimates made in 2005 requiring global agricultural production to double to feed an estimated 9.7 billion people in 2050 can be revised downward. Gains over the last decade reveal a production increase as low as 26 percent could meet global demand. And so we're a decade on from that now, and we've actually seen, at least in terms of cereal crops like corn and wheat, global production has gone up by about a quarter in that time span. So the original projection that maybe we need to double production, you can already cut back quite a bit just based on the additional production that we've seen. The assumption is that as the world gets wealthier, per capita consumption of meat and dairy is going to go up. The estimates also allow for growth in the production of ethanol and other biofuels around the world. The lower production target suggests agriculture can meet what once appeared to be an impossible target. With all the ingenuity and all the research and tinkering that happens on farms, I think we can do it. I don't think it's going to be easy, but I think we can do it. From Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. In late January, a press release from the Ohio Pork Council speculated a drop in the frozen pork belly inventory would trigger a surge in bacon prices. Rumors of a bacon apocalypse joined other Armageddon-like references to a shortage of the tasty meat snack and, like the rest, they turned out to be unfounded. However, the specter of recent developments with processed meats have caused some to pause as they approach the table. Josh Bittner has the details in our cover story. In 2015, carnivores worldwide were stunned by news from the World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer that their diets might be dishing them up disease. Pouring over 800 epidemiological studies, the WHO labeled red meat a probable carcinogen suggesting a possible connection to colorectal, pancreatic, and prostate cancers. But some health officials say consumers have taken the warning with a grain of salt. I think we think about these guidelines as evolving. Um, it's been a pretty consistent message by many leading organizations, both related to cancer as well as cardiovascular disease, that red meat may increase risk. 
University of Iowa lecturer and dietitian Dr. Kathy Mellon says the conclusions of the 22 health experts from 10 countries tax onto decades of medical knowledge about diet and disease prevention, but fails to pin the tail on lamb, pork, or beef. However, the IARC did issue its most dire classification for other American food staples. And hot dogs, cold cuts, and bacon also struck out with other global health authorities. There is enough evidence there for many organizations to say we should significantly limit the processed meats in our diet. Last year, the American Institute for Cancer Research and the World Cancer Research Fund reiterated WHO findings that for every 1.8 ounces or 50 grams of processed meat eaten per day, the risk of lower stomach cancers increases by 18 percent. But such findings have come under fire in Washington. In recent months, Utah Representative Jason Chaffetz charged the international agency routinely declares nearly everything cancerous, from hot beverages to one of the world's most widely used herbicides. News which prompted the nation's largest farm production state to list Roundup as a carcinogen. California is currently in the legal ring sparring with Monsanto over the classification. Experts say the WHO's food findings only up the average lifetime risk of developing colon carcinoma via consumption of salted, cured, fermented, and smoked meats from 5 to 6 percent, a lower danger level when compared to cigarettes and asbestos, which share the category of known carcinogens. What do you think of that? I think everything causes cancer anymore, so. Many in Iowa, the heart of the bacon belt, and a state with more pigs than people, believe the notion of killer meat can hoof it. Is it good? It's awesome. Rather than wallow in disappointment, Go bacon! <laughs> the Blue Ribbon Bacon Festival, the Hawkeye State's immensely popular celebration of all things bacon, herds over 10,000 meat lovers into the state's capital city every year. 100% Berkshire pork. Themes differ annually, but organizers point out healthy lifestyle changes can always tip the scale. Sometimes bacon gets a bad rap. With a balanced diet, you know, you can incorporate bacon into your diet and make it a healthy, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's good fat, good protein. Tastefully clad Brooks Reynolds, the self-described face of bacon, and other founding members have seen Bacon Fest grow exponentially since its 2007 kickoff. I think it's the perfect food. It's salty, it's sweet. I don't eat bacon every day. I love it, but I don't. You know, they're kind of using scare tactics. You know, hot dogs are bad for you, meat's bad for you. You know, again, everything in moderation. According to USDA, there are 67.6 million head of hogs across the U.S., with Iowa as the nation's number one producer. Figures from the Iowa Pork Producers Association indicate over $6 billion in annual sales. All those cuts and conglomerations are both freshly cooked and cured to extend shelf life. And common preservatives like sodium nitrate and nitrite have become a major target of cancer warnings. But some niche producers assert that an uncured approach, utilizing natural safeguards like celery brine, may be safer and taste better. As minimally processed as possible is what we're about. Berkwood Farms, a co-op of about 40 family operations, supplies the Berkshire breed to the Blue Ribbon Bacon Festival, along with a range of products in Iowa and beyond. All of our products are a nitrite-free product, so I don't really consider ours as processed meat, um, like all the other larger corporations. Pork producer Randy Hilleman says Berkwood Farms production techniques have earned a reputation among discerning consumers who yearn for the good old days. It kind of started 20, 30 years ago or 40 years ago when they, they started buying pork by lean premium. And so they got the pigs leaner and leaner and leaner. Well, the flavor is in the fat. And if you don't have any fat, you don't have the flavor. I don't know how many people have said that is the best ham they've ever had in their life, even 80-year-olds. Berkwood Farms hopes the appetite for nostalgia can help grow their business. And as medical authorities seek to first do no harm, 
Debate over meat products will continue to be processed by all stakeholders. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Next, the Market to Market report. A statement by the Renewable Fuels Association that President Trump would sign an executive order shifting ethanol blending from the refiner to the retailer sent the grain markets into orbit. This was followed by an equally significant plunge once the White House denied the claim. Despite the seesaw, the final session ended in positive territory. For the week, May wheat gained a nickel and the nearby corn contract added a dime. Wet weather in Brazil, stranding grain trucks, helped push the May soybean contract up 13 cents. May meal went the other way, losing 270 per ton. In the softs, May cotton gained $1.42 per hundred weight. Over in the dairy parlor, March Class 3 milk futures fell 35 cents. The livestock sector was mixed as the April cattle contract gained $1.03. March feeders increased to 53, and the April lean hog contract shed $1.28. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index gained 46 basis points. Crude oil lost 66 cents per barrel. Comex gold fell 31.80 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs commodity index lost more than three points to finish the week at 398.40. Here now, Clindus, her insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Sue Martin. Sue, welcome back. Thank you, Mike. Before we get started, you can listen to our market discussion anytime by downloading our market analysis podcast on our website, iptv.org slash MTOM. Sue Martin, volatile week in the markets this week. We touched on it right there. We had some rumors, and uh, really the rumor mill was going on about Tuesday with the RFS. Before we get into the grains, can you talk to us a little bit about why the trade exploded on that news? Why did we move up so much? Well, I think first off, uh, the market's been fairly quiet. And so it, you know, the calm before the storm, so to speak. And then when that news hit or rumor of it hit, uh, they were instantly thinking, oh, you know, E15 year round. They're thinking up oh, more bushels of corn and soybeans going into biodiesel and ethanol means more demand and cuts into the carryouts. And so that sent the market running. Gotcha. And then it all disappeared once we had confirmation that there was no such executive order. Well, it did to a degree. The market faded as the when the White House, you know, um, denounced it. But on the same token, then the next day it was back up and then the beans kind of wiped out. But the corn kind of floated and hung right in there. It's almost like they're thinking where there's smoke, there's fire. Okay. Like they don't totally trust the denouncing. Like they think there's something in the in the background yet that just hasn't been announced. All right. So we did see that carry the corn market higher. Beans, of course, very volatile week. But also the wheat market finished higher. Was that just continued buying spillover support from corn and soybeans? Or was there a more fundamental factor under wheat? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. I think that uh, the strength in the corn and the beans helped support the wheat market and wheat had had a nice little sell-off into you know the 28th and then it turned stronger but also and that's another thing we had cycle timing for a low there and so we did get our response higher but also in wheat all these warm above normal temperatures you know uh, not only with Iowa being you know the warmest February on record but also the the winter wheat belt is also dealing with very warm above normal temperatures and much of uh, March sounds like the same thing. Okay. So what it does is it brings the weed out of dormancy earlier, sets it up, it gets it growing, and then the next thing you know it's farther along when you get into April and all of a sudden you can get caught with some really cold snaps. I think that we're going to see a little bit of weather premium being added into the wheat. Okay, is that weather premium that producers ought to be taking advantage of making some sales or do we hold on if you've got winter wheat growing and see where this thing takes us? Well, I think we've already met a wave three in the, like for example on the KC May. Um, so that, and just as we have in beans, um, so that's giving the market time to breathe. But a wave four takes you up over five dollars on May KC wheat, maybe up around five thirty-three. So the market, if if you scared the market, it could do that, especially after a pause. Okay, because there are still, it is still a, a fund net short position in the wheat market, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay. In fact, commercials added thirty-four thousand contracts short 
uh, or to their short position on wheat as of February 28th. Okay. Let's take a look at this corn market, Sue Martin. As you mentioned, volatile still ended a little higher. The trade might still be thinking we could see some changes to the RFS. Yes. On a fundamental factor, we know we've got big carryouts. This old crop corn market, how do producers need to be handling it? With this volatility today, do we continue to sit back and see what happens in South America, or do we start making some pretty hefty sales? Well, I have yet to really push people to make sales. And here's a, and just, this is just a, it's no guarantee, but history sometimes can give you a clue of what might happen. And it's just another tool in a toolbox. But um, when I go back and I look at December corn, Andes corn made higher highs over December and January and followed by a higher high again in February. Well, in the last 47 years, that's only happened 19 years, so not even 50% of the time. Out of those 19 years, 18 of them went on to see higher highs again. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean there can't be a dip in the market. There can be. Um, there is a cycle coming in, um, something similar to when we talked about the 84-year cycle, putting a low in on January 9th. We were thinking the 9th. The low came on Friday the 6th, and the turn came on the 9th. And that was a low. You know, we went down through December, hit that low, and then rebounded out of there. Okay, there is another potential for another dip back in beans into that. And I don't mean to be going off of corn into beans. I'm trying to tie it all together. Sure. But, but beans are working in a coil, so to speak, or a triangle from the lows of a year ago in March, on March 2nd. And then you look at corn, and here we are. You know, it's, it's holding against that $4 area, 404 uh, was your high, and so now you've got uh, a market that's, even though they've reneged on what the rumor was, it still is holding up there because we're looking at four million less acres of corn. Yes. But, you know, four million less acres than 2016, but still ahead of the acres that we had in 2015. But here's the catch-22. We have talk of about El Nino coming in, may come in earlier. Some say, okay, it might hit us in July or to August. Others are saying it looks like it's on target to be here sooner, mm. maybe by Ju May, June. If that happens, that could then start to give us some moisture to help us out in the U.S., but what does it do? It creates havoc in India, Southeast Asia, China especially. Okay. And India is one country that not very many people talk about, but problems in India with a growing economy, a good growing economy, I'm going to tell you, that is a country that we, I think, need to be looking to because China has so much going on right now between uncertainty over Donald Trump's, President Trump's uh, mm -hmm. policies, uncertainty with Xi Jinping, you know, he's up for vote at the yes. end of this year. Um, that twice a, in a decade, I believe, they re-elect or run that pattern again. And so, you know, you have uncertainty with the, po mm -hmm. you know, with the populace. Um, and then you've got, uh, they've been dealing with a lot of uh, bird flu. Right. You know, and he's got uh, the, the uh, president or the leader of uh, North Korea kind of in his yeah. backyard being a little bit of a stinker. So there's a lot of factors coming together that make China a little risky, but India could be coming up quick on the backside. They could so, be coming up quick and outdo what China could be doing. Interesting. So as we look at China, at India, on the corn side, they could be buying some grain there. When we think of soybeans, so when you talked about the soybean market briefly, we do have a big crop coming out of Brazil, it sounds like. Folks are starting to get nervous. Mm -hmm. Is that nervousness justified? Are we going to see a big sell-off here as that Brazilian crop comes online? Well, I think, you know, the Brazilian crop is coming online. It's kind of been slowed down in Paraná because of too much rain, but they are exporting more because of earlier planted crops in Mato Grosso. So they have been at a pace greater than a year ago. Amazingly, it's almost like the fish with, that each fish keeps getting bigger. Uh, I've heard some estimates already up to 108 million metric tons. I heard tons. that Friday, yes. Yes, and I think, well, maybe. the USD, What it says to me is the USDA is probably going to raise their numbers here in Brazil th in this next report. Okay. Um, I look at uh, Argentina as I think the fly in the ointment. Um, Argentina is the one, they're the world's largest exporter of soy meal mm -hmm. and soy oil, very leading in soy oil. And if they continue or something turns on them weather-wise, because there's still plenty of time on them, all of a sudden we could see a downdraft yet again, and then 
all of a sudden it sends less meal to go out the door. They come to the U.S. We process the rest of the beans okay. here. And so then, there's still some opportunity, even as we look at this big crop. There is, but you know what, uh, Mike, and I talked about this last December, I think, about the foreign production deficit. Yes. And it was record large, which means it takes the U.S. out of the picture, keeps everybody else in that picture. Now, Brazil and Argentina are part of that, and all of a sudden, they were so record tight, or the need by the foreign buyer was record large, because they weren't producing as well a year ago. Now that crop is okay. there. So now that shifts all that importance back over to the U.S. and say, okay, you're maybe not the largest producer now on beans, but you're close. Okay. So you have to produce too because the global demand has been growing for beans. Excellent. All right, we've spent a lot of time on the grain soup because so much has happened, but I want to get your thoughts quickly on the cattle market. Are we going to see the deferred live cattle contracts come up to meet the cash market, do you think? Well, you know, the cattle market in the deferred contracts has started to gain this week against the April. But that was because of spreads, the Goldman rolls coming, and you had other index funds starting last Tuesday when we had hit almost 119 on April cattle, got to 118.95. They started doing their, their rollout. So that puts pressure on the April, pushes it down. But you're a $10 spread from the cash market. Now, some will say, you know, Packers bought a lot of cattle this week. 580,000, I think, for the weekly kill estimate. Okay. That shows they, they were able to get cattle bought. I think the kill was up, I want to say, 7% from a year ago. But you got to remember, that's more numbers being pulled ahead. Lighter weights, tonnage is still going to have to stay up there. A year ago, what did we have different than a year ago? A year ago, you had heavy, heavy, heavy cattle. And the packer kept trying to entice them this way by keeping the cash right. propped up. Why? Because he knew the demand was going to be good. The packer isn't going to give you anything good unless he knows it benefits himself. Right. And he's looking at peak season for grilling this year, starting in May to mm -hmm. June. And he's wanting to pull because he thinks numbers are going to be tight going okay. into April. He's pulling those cattle ahead. Okay, so could see could see that cash stay strong moving out through at least the start of grilling season. Well, I kind of think so. You know, the cash, because of that spread, you might see cash soften a little bit. Okay. Next week we think steady. Okay. Um, but I, I got to tell you, the April cattle, I know there's a lot of bears out there. Okay. But the April cattle in years past, um, I went back and looked at, at the last 39 years when we had February's go off the board strong. And out of those years, there were 23 of them. 21 of them saw the April contract go on and make higher highs. Okay. Before we let you go, Sue, we got to talk about this hog market. Broke a little bit this week. This has been a very volatile market. Is the, is the risk to the upside or the downside as you look at lean hogs? I think we're going to get a little bit cheaper. Uh, the kill is pretty good. We're killing good numbers of hogs. Um, I think that um, hogs are going to drop off a little bit more. But yet I look at 65 cents. That seems to me like maybe an area where we could catch as well. All right. So not much lower in a way. And then we've got to see what happens at that level. If we break through that, well, we'll see what happens. But then how can hogs just, don't ever say how, but right. how Especially does it fall with the apart hog market. with the cattle yes. doing it? I feel like they're buying cattle, selling hogs. Okay. Well, we will keep an eye on that. Thank you so much for joining us, Sue Martin. Thank you. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market, but Sue and I will keep the conversation going. We will answer more of your questions during Market Plus, which is available on our website. Now, Market to Market may be airing in different time slots due to fundraising on PBS. So if you find value in our program, please consider making a pledge and invest in a program that provides you with the news and market analysis you've come to know and trust. And join us next week when we'll explore how some producers are hedging against catastrophe. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by... Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, 
Sukup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.